Now, as I mentioned in our last Bible study, Genesis 4, 7 is one of the more difficult verses in the entire Bible, and it has been proving difficult to students of the Bible for centuries, more than likely for millennium. This has been a difficult verse and just almost impossible to understand. It doesn't make sense completely. If we look at the scripture verse just historically and we try to understand Cain, the man, as the one God is speaking of, that's when it doesn't seem to make sense. And it's mostly the second part of verse 7 that's the problem when God says, And unto thee, speaking to Cain, shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And we think that it's saying to Cain that sin's desire will be towards Cain, but Cain will rule over him, somehow referring back to sin. And it doesn't make sense because Cain is a wicked man. He's of the wicked one, according to 1 John 3, 12. He is an unsaved individual. And shortly he's about to kill his brother. He's a murderer. And it does not make sense that he will rule over sin. But maybe God helps us here in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. And there it says, Unto the woman that will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now, here we understand what God is saying. He's speaking to the woman, to Eve. Her desire will be to her husband, Adam. And he, Adam, will rule over thee, or over Eve, the wife. The husband rules the wife. Spiritually, again, no problem. Eve, a picture of Jerusalem above, of the elect. She came out of Adam's side and Adam, a figure of Christ. And so the elect's desire is to our spiritual husband, Jesus, and he, Jesus, shall rule over the woman, the bride of Christ. It's very understandable. And then the second place it's used is in Song of Solomon, chapter 7, verse 10. It says, I am my beloved's, and his desire is toward me. Now, we know that the beloved is a word describing the Lord Jesus. It is David, as King David pictures Christ, and David's name means beloved. I am my beloved's, says the bride of Christ, and his desire is toward me. And we saw that Eve's desire is to her husband. And now, in Song of Solomon 7, verse 10, is letting us know that the love, the desire in this spiritual union, the spiritual marriage between Christ and his eternal church, flows both ways. There's love and desire from the body of Christ to the spiritual bridegroom, and there's love and desire from the bridegroom going towards the bride. So that means the word desire in both Song of Solomon and in Genesis 3.16 involves marriage. It involves marriage, the marriage relationship. A spiritual marriage actually is also in view, and it is a word that relates to spiritual marriage. Now, the word that's translated as rule, if we go back to Genesis 4 verse 7, it says, Unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Rule is Strong's 49.10. It's the same word that's also in Genesis 3.16, last part of the verse. And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Well, that's the way God has established marriage and the home. The husband rules the house. The husband rules in the home. He is the authority in the household. He rules, and the wife is to be in submission. So the word dominion is the word rule. Someone has authority over the earthly home. The husband has authority over the wife. Spiritually, Christ has authority over his bride, the eternal church. 
But what could be in view in Genesis 4, 7? Again, let me read the whole verse. If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Again, what could possibly be in view? Since we know the word desire relates to marriage, and the word rule also is involved in marriage, how could Cain in this statement be related to marriage? Well, remember what God tells us in the New Testament in the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 7, the first two verses, the Lord lays down a very important truth. It says in Romans 7 verse 1, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. And there is the idea of dominion. And then in verse 2, For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. Now I want to skip down to verse 4 of Romans 7. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. They should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Now here, when God says the law has dominion over a man in verse 1, and then he speaks of the body of Christ becoming dead to the law, that ye should be married to another. And he had just mentioned verse 2, that a woman's bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband be dead, she is loosed and free to marry. And then God uses that earthly picture to teach the spiritual reality that all men, all mankind, all people are bound or married to the law. God has joined men that he created to the law in a spiritual marriage. And the law has dominion over the man, over mankind, over each person. The only thing that can interrupt that marriage of the law having dominion and rule over the man is if Christ has died for a certain individual and then in the body of Christ, he's dead to the law. And then he can be married to another who would be Jesus. And that's the spiritual marriage that the Bible tells us about. And so in the Bible, there are two marriages spiritually. There is the marriage of all human beings that have ever entered into the world to the law of God. And they will remain in that marriage unless... Jesus takes their sins and dies for them, and through his death, the body of Christ become dead to the law, and then are free to marry another who is Jesus himself. And that would be the second spiritual marriage that's possible, a marriage with Christ. So with every human being, everyone in the world, every person is married, not an earthly marriage. This is speaking spiritually. Every person from the baby conceived in the womb to the oldest person living anywhere in the world and everyone in between, every individual is married. We're either married to Christ through that process of becoming dead to the law and we're married to another, or we're married to the law itself. Christ has not interceded on our behalf, so any married to the law, they remain married to the law. But every human being is married to either Christ through salvation or bound to the law and under its dominion. And basically, just like we understand every human being is either saved or unsaved, that's saying in another way. We're either married to the law or we're married to Christ, which means saved and unsaved. We can see two types of people, saved and unsaved, two covenants. The covenant of grace and the covenant of works. The covenant of being saved through Christ and married to him 
or the covenant of remaining married to the law of God. They're all saying the same thing. And, you know, I think God has given away who Cain represents when he said in Jude, verse 11, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. The way of Cain rather than the way of Christ. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The way of Cain is the way of attempting to please God through works. And works is trying to keep the law. Trying to keep the law to get right with God. Trying to be obedient to the commands of God. Well, this sets up Cain and Abel as a figure, each one of their respected covenant, each one of their respected spiritual marriage, one of grace and of the free, the other of bondage, like Hagar, identified with Mount Sinai and the law, Cain, the way of Cain. And so here, let's understand Cain as representing the law and the law has dominion over man, the unsaved. So in verse 7, God speaking to Cain, representative of the law. If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. That is, if a man, according to the law, according to works, keeps the whole law, he'll be accepted with God. And then God continues, And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. If you fail to keep the whole law, even in one point, you're guilty of all. You're convicted of sin. And then it goes on to say, And unto thee, that's Cain, representing the law, shall be his desire, man's desire, in the spiritual marriage, just like Eve's desire to her husband, or the beloved's desire to his bride, the desire of man in his spiritual marriage to the law, Unto thee shall be his desire. Man desires to get right with God through keeping the law. And then in the last statement, And thou, Cain, representative of the law, shalt rule over him, shalt have dominion over the man, just as Romans 7 tells us in the first verse. The law has dominion over the man as long as man lives unless Christ intercedes and delivers him from that state of bondage to the law so he can marry another who is Jesus. Now, I think that's how we understand this verse. Everything seems to fit together once we look at it from the deeper spiritual perspective, then God's statements to Cain fall into place. Mm -hmm. 